All right, this is part two. And if you haven't watched part one, the link is in the description below. If this is your first time of coming here, please hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and I'm going to be teaching you on this channel many things about Catholic theology, and I will simplify them very simply so that you don't have to worry about big words and all those stuff. And I'm also going to be teaching you how you can use Catholic principles and Catholic teachings to improve your life. If that is something that you're looking for, then subscribe to this channel and watch all the videos. Just binge watch all the videos and you're going to enjoy. So in part one, we already talked about hell and now in part two, we're going to see who goes to heaven. So the Bible gave us what I like to call a criteria for heaven and it says, and into the city will be brought the glory and honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it. Now, anyone who practices an abomination or a lie, but only those whose name are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So right here, we see basically a summary of who goes to heaven. Nothing unclean will ever enter it. If you turn this into a positive sentence, it means only what is clean will enter into heaven. And this is Revelation 21, 26, 27. So not even venial sins, right? And I told you that anything that is not a mortal sin is a venial sin. And we already looked at what mortal sin is. It meets three criteria. If you watched part one, it meets three criteria. And if you haven't watched part one again, go to the link in the description, right? That's the last time I'm going to say that. So it meets three criteria. If it meets only two criteria or one criteria, what is the singular for criteria? Well, then it would be a venial sin, okay? But here it says, nothing unclean. Venial sins are still well sins, right? So not even venial sin can enter into heaven. And here, the Bible actually gives us basis for mortal sin and venial sin. It says, if you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death. So he's talking about spiritual death. Your soul is dead and that is mortal sin. That's what we call mortal sin, right? So basically he's saying if you see a brother or sister commit a sin that is not a mortal sin, which is that is a venial sin, you should pray and God will give them life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There's a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is sin that does not lead to death. So, what is St. John trying to tell us here? He's trying to tell us that there's a difference between mortal sin and venial sin. And he's saying, there is a sin that leads to death. I am not saying you should pray about that. Which means, for mortal sin, you do not pray about that. Every wrongdoing is sin, yes. But there is venial sin, and there is mortal sin. So, what does mortal sin need? Mortal sin needs something else, confession, right? And we know that venial sin does not kill the soul. It does not lead to death. So if it does not kill the soul, then we know that venial sin will not take someone to hell. It will take someone where? That's the question. So if it's not taking someone to hell, however, it can't take you to heaven, right? If you die in venial sin, you can't go to heaven. Now, what's going to happen to people who have venial sins? Well, first of all, venial sin is not good sin. There is no such thing as good sin, right? Venial sin, sin is sin, right? But let me try to use these diagrams to demonstrate what, you know, um, venial sin and mortal sin are in relation to you and God. So this is state of grace. What does state of grace mean in the Catholic Church? It means you're free from mortal sin, right? So this is where you are just after you've, you know, gone for confession or you just got baptized or something like that. This is the state you are, right? Then there is venial sin and mortal sin. What happens in venial sin is that charity is injured. So You've, you've wounded yourself and you've hurt God and God is sad because you have decided to choose something very stupid and now you're leaving God, but you're still attached to him, right? So you're not dead. Your soul is not dead. And by you, I mean your soul. Your soul is not dead because it's still with God who is life, 
right? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So you are not dead. You're still with God. Mortal sin, however, you're completely separated from God. That is why John says it leads to death, right? If you are separated from life, you're dead. And if you die in this state, it's eternal. Because on earth, we have choice. We choose whatever we want. But these, these things have consequences. Every sin has a consequence, all right? So if we choose this, after we die, God is not going to force us against our will to be with him in heaven. He's going to honor this wish and he's going to stay away from us forever, right? And you see, the problem with that is that if we're staying away from God who is life and love and goodness and all this stuff, it means where we are now is not life, not love, not goodness, not all this stuff, just complete utter pain and torture. And that, my friends, is how you define hell, complete utter pain and torture. I should write that somewhere. That, that's a very good definition of hell. Okay? So this is what happens. This is state of grace. You're with God happily ever after. In venial sin, you have injured charity. You're separating yourself from God. In mortal sin, you're completely separate from God. And you see, venial sin can lead to mortal sin because, see, your butt is already out here. The men in your head, and then your head is soon going to come out here, right? So it can lead to venial sin, to mortal sin, and that is why we do not call venial sin good sin. Because even from here, just by this part already being outside, you're already offending God and you're hurting your own soul, right? So that's bad. Okay, and this is where Jesus gives the priest the power to forgive. It says, Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them. So who are the them? The apostles. And said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So what is happening here? Let's look at it again. And Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. What Jesus is basically saying is that the Father has authority to forgive sin. Now, the Father has sent Jesus, and Jesus has the authority to forgive sin. And with that same authority, Jesus is sending the apostles. So, the apostles now have the authority of the Father to forgive sins, and they will be forgiven. Okay? And this if you notice, has no limitations. Like in the in the one the one we read in First John chapter five, verse sixteen to seventeen, where it says, um, "There's a sin that leads to death. Do not pray about that." So it's basically saying that the prayer can affect venial sins, but it cannot affect mortal sins. But in this authority that Jesus Christ is giving them, there is no limit. It affects all sins. It can forgive all sins, right? But with this authority, now Jesus did not give them you know, omniscience, which means they cannot know all things. And that is why you must go to confession. Even though the priest can forgive mortal sins, which you can't get rid of by just praying, asking for forgiveness, you have to go for confession because scripture says so. Um, they do not, they cannot just know your sins and forgive you. So you have to tell them your sins. And then they forgive you. And that, my friends, is what confession is. And it also has another advantage, frankly, because then you get to, it humbles you. It makes you humble. It also makes you understand that there are consequences for your sin. Because just the process of going to another human being and confessing makes you feel kind of uneasy. But when you know that this is, God's will, and this is how God chooses to make his grace available to you, then you have courage and you have strength. And so you, you're you humbled in pride, your pride is removed, and your humility makes you understand God's will even better and makes you more capable of doing it. Another thing is that the grace gives you, you know, the confession gives you grace, not just forgives you your sins, the sins that you've already committed, but also gives you grace to withstand future temptations, which is why I always recommend go to confession multiple times. Multiple times. I always recommend this. 
go to confession multiple times. And why is that? It's because you, you get grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. Now, the human body cannot withhold grace. We cannot hold grace forever, right? We lose grace every single day. As the day passes, we lose grace. And that is why we pray every single day. And that is why we, you know, go for confession regularly. We go for mass regularly because we cannot, we don't just get one grace at baptism and that grace is like eternal and we never lose it, right? Because of the way we are, we're prone to sin, we lose grace, okay? So when you go for confession, you get grace to withstand future temptations, right? And many people are going to ask, well, what if I haven't um, committed any mortal sin? What am I going to confess? Well, if you haven't committed any mortal sin, congratulations. But then now you need to go for confession so that you will not commit mortal sin in the future. You're going to have grace to resist the, the mortal sin in the future, right? So that is good. So what do you confess? When you don't have mortal sins, you start looking for internal things, right? So this is the, an opportunity to look inward and start looking at things like pride, things like arrogance, things like anger, things like malice, things like, you know, lust, all those subtle things that don't really show up, but that come from within. Things like laziness, things like not praying enough during the day and not doing your spiritual duties during the day. Things like not giving alms. So you're now focusing on sins of omission, not sins of commission, right? So uh, when you're still struggling with mortal sins, most of the things you're going to be confessing are things you did. I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. But when you stop doing bad things, and you stop confessing those ones because you're no longer doing them. Now you're now looking at things that you should have done, good things that you should have done that you didn't do. I didn't help this person, and and I was proud, and I wasn't, you know, I didn't, you know, things like that, internal things. And then when you when you're dealing with those ones, it's also good to ask the people around you who know you, right? So the people who live with you, the people you're closest to, the people you interact with every day, and you ask them, do you know anything about me that I could improve, right? And they will, usually they will tell you, they will say, okay, dude, um, you always go late for things. You, you never on time, man. You need, to, you need to check that. You need to go early. And then you can work on that. And then you can talk with your spiritual director about that in confession as well. And then God gives you the grace. And confession makes you an overall better person, physically, spiritually, all around. Because it pours out the graces of God directly from Jesus Christ, from his mercy, right? That's so powerful. That is why I recommend that you go for confession every single week. If you're out of your mind and you missed the week because you were feeling like Hulk or like Superman and strong or something, don't let it exceed two weeks. And there are many people who had this, this habit and they became saints, very many people. And one of them is Mother Teresa, right? Saint Teresa of Calcutta. And we all know her story. And you have the story of St. John Paul II. And even our present Pope, Pope Francis, he goes for confession regularly, right? He goes, and, and there's something I read where they said he doesn't pass 24 days before he goes for his next confession. So he likes doing it weekly, but worst case scenario, he doesn't like it to be over three weeks, right? But I suggest, and this is a holy man, this is the Pope, right? This is the Pope we're talking about. How much more should you go? Okay? So, you should go weekly. Weekly. Many saints have gone weekly and it has helped them seriously. And you too should go weekly. Worst case scenario, once in two weeks. All right? It will really help you. Okay. So, the middle one is purgatory. If you go to hell, it's eternal. If you don't have mortal sin, and you don't have anything on clean venial sins or whatever, you go to heaven and it's eternal. If you go to purgatory, however, it's for you to be purged for a short period of time and it's temporary. And after purgatory, you'll go 
into heaven. So we need to look at this purgatory more detailed. What is purgatory? Well, if you read the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it says, the church gives the name purgatory to this final purification of the elect. So the elect means the chosen ones, right? The, the good guys who God has seen that they, they should come to heaven. But then there's a final purification, which is entirely different from the punishment of the damned which is the people who go to hell, which is uh, permanent. Now, this final purification will then lead to heaven. It's not permanent, is it will lead to heaven. And we see from 1 Corinthians 3.15, where it's talking about works being tested by fire. And we also see 1 Peter 1.7, which talks about the refining fire. We see Matthew 12. 31, we talks about an unforgivable sin, which is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And it's interesting why we point this out is because it's interesting. He says that um, this sin cannot be forgiven, whether in this life or in the next life, implying that some sins can be forgiven in the next life. And those sins are the sins which do not lead to death, which are venial sins, right? Like we see from Scripture. And what is this unforgivable sin? Many people have a problem when they see this part of the Bible that talks about unforgivable sin or blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And blasphemy is when you say or do something that is against a holy person or thing or object or something like that. So um, if I picked up a uh, you know, holy cross and I threw it on the ground or something like that, or I cursed the priest, or I said something against God, or something like that. So holy person, place, or God, all of that will be blasphemy, right? And yeah, and it, it, depending on the situation, okay, so that is that. So why is this sin unforgivable? Basically because you reject the, the forgiveness of God and the work of the Holy Spirit, and that is why it is unforgivable. I keep saying God is a gentle man and um, he's not going to force himself on you. So blasphemy in general is not unforgivable. But why the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is unforgivable is because you're rejecting God's um, love and forgiveness. And let me, let me point out, you know, six sins that the church calls um, sins against the Holy Spirit or blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. There are six of them, right? And the first one is called presumption. Now, presumption is when you continue to live your life anyhow and you're, you're, just, you're just messing around and doing all sorts of silly stuff because you believe that, oh, well, God is all merciful anyway and no matter what I do or say or whatever, he's still going to forgive me and he's all merciful. So you live your life carefree, right? That is presumption and that is if you die in that state, that is unforgivable, either in this life or in the next, you're going straight to hell. Why? Because during your entire life, instead of seeking God's forgiveness and repenting and turning from your sin, you kept on telling yourself, oh, well, whatever I do, God is merciful and is going to forgive me anyway, and blah, 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 and you just continue, right? So it makes sense why, well, it won't be forgiven because you never even sought God's forgiveness and you blocked yourself from God's forgiveness to begin with. The second one is called despair. Despair is unforgivable because despair, when you're in the state of despair, what happens is that you tell yourself that your particular sin is so difficult and so impossible for God to forgive because it's so huge and you feel like you've done the you've committed the greatest sin and you're like ah oh, and you never ask for forgiveness and you never go back to confession and you never do any of that. That is despair. And sometimes people also feel like even if they go for confession well there's no way they could ever be rid of this sin. And this usually happens also when people are uh, the two sins that can do this to people, right? And one of them is things that have to do with sexual immorality, pornography, masturbation, adultery, fornication, things like that. And the second one is murder. So if you ever kill somebody, it can have a great, you know, psychological impact on you where you begin to believe that you're unforgivable and God will never forgive you and things like that. Well, 
Forgiveness is for everyone who repents, everyone who comes to God with an intention to change their lives, right? Even though you do not see a plan of how you can do it, go to God and his mercy is going to still be there for you. Turn to God and he will forgive you. That's just it. So if somebody continues in despair and they believe that, oh, their sin is so hard and God will not forgive them or God cannot forgive them, so they close themselves entirely from God's forgiveness. And then guess what? God can't forgive them. And so they reject the Holy Spirit. They reject the mercy of God. They reject all of that. And now they can't be forgiven. Okay, so another one is resisting the known truth. So number three, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is resisting the known truth. And what is resisting the known truth is when you know something is right and you're still rejecting it. So like many times I'm going to show people in the Bible uh, that there is mortal sin and there is venial sin. I'm going to show them in the Bible that Jesus has given the priest the authority to forgive sins. I'm going to show them everything and they'll still be like, no. I'm just going to pray to my God and he will forgive me. I don't have to go to any priest. It's uncomfortable. I don't need to go to priests. I can just pray to my God. And so they know what the church teaches. Them. They know what God wants. They know the truth, but they still reject it. Now, you can't, you can't do that. Why? Because it's the Holy Spirit that reveals this thing. It's the Holy Spirit that is with the church that teaches us, the Holy Spirit that Christ gave to the church. And now if you resist the truth, you're resisting God, right? And that is bad. Another one is envy of another spiritual good. So many times, um, so let's say I'm struggling with pornography and I meet someone who's not struggling with pornography and I begin to say, oh, they think they're so perfect. And, oh, why why would God make me suffer like this? And then he's not going to make the other person suffer like me. And now those people think they're so perfect because they're not suffering like me. And you begin to become envious of the estate because they're not struggling. Or you begin to become envious of the spiritual gifts that they have received. That is bad. Why is it bad? Because from that um thinking what could happen next is that you could start becoming just like the devil to that person. You start looking for ways to bring those people down, to talk bad against those people, to slander them, to encourage them to do certain sins, to lead them astray. You will have so many thoughts. And another thing is that instead of focusing on your own flaws and on how you can work with the Holy Spirit to improve them, you're not going to do that. You're going to start trying to focus on their flaws and to pinpoint every single place they are not so perfect as they think they are and things like that. And that is why this is so wrong because you just become like the devil. You start antagonizing holy people and antagonizing people who are growing in faith and antagonizing people who are trying to be perfect as their heavenly father is perfect as we are told to do in matthew chapter 5 verse 48 so another one is obstinacy in sin what is obstinacy in sin you have no plan to get out of sin you're just sinning all day every day all week every week sundown sun up rainfall sunshine spring always you're just sinning and many times people have this messed up idea that um sin and confession are supposed to go like hand in hand it's like a balance of some sort so every week they do like 10 sins and then at the weekend they come and confess everything they get a clean slate and then they go and refill their sin jar and come and get a clean slate again so they have no intention of ever getting rid of those sins those sins are like part of their lives and they many times they use very innocent words to talk about sin like they will say things like you know you're living your best life or you're having fun or you're living life to the fullest or things like and these are actually good things right but then they use them to associate with sin but jesus christ said i have come so that they may have life and have it to the fullest to have abundant life abundant life is when you're with the life jesus christ when you're doing things that the life wants you to do. And that is where you get eternal life, right? That's where you get heaven and all of that, right? But when you're obstinate in sin, 
you have no intention of getting rid of sin. You're just, you just keep going. And why that is so dangerous is because you're resisting God's power to change you, God's power to transform you, God's power to bring you into the kingdom. And then God can't do that anymore because he's a gentleman and he's not going to violate your free will. And so you make it straight to hell. Okay. The last one, um, sin against the Holy Spirit is called final impenitence. Final impenitence is where last, last, you decide not to um, repent, right? You just decide that you're not going to repent, and that's final. That is final impenitence. It just makes perfect sense when you just simplify everything. So, um, unforgivable sin, presumption, despair, resisting the known truth, envy of another spiritual good obstinacy in sin and final impenitence and jesus christ tells us this cannot be forgiven either in this life or in the next life and again why did we bring this up because it implies that there is a sin that can be forgiven in the next life and that will be forgiven in purgatory where there will be final purification in all places maccabees so this is this is so cool because it says it is therefore a holy and Wholesome thought to pray for the dead that they may be loosed from their sins. Very important. Loosed from sins. Now, if they're in hell, there is no losing from sins. Hell is eternal. If they're in heaven, there is no need to pray for them to be loosed from their sins because there is no sin in heaven, right? So the only place this makes sense is in purgatory, right? So this is another Bible verse that talks about it. And then you have Job, right? So um, why should we pray for them? We have Job who was doing sin offerings for his children. So when you read the book of Job, it says that Job would do sin offerings for his children to be loosed from their sins. So if Job's sin offerings could make someone to be loosed from their sins, it means that our prayers could also make someone to be loosed from their sins. All right? And then there's another Bible verse that says, The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. So this is purgatory. This is the final place of purification. And it's just like hell. All the punishment, everything. Many people think that purgatory is like limbo, like we talked about in part one. Like purgatory is like limbo. It's just a chill spot waiting for heaven. No. Purgatory is purification. And, and we see by fire. It talks about fire. multiple. So it's just like hell. It's fire. The only difference is that here is temporal and and hell is eternal, right? Here is temporal, hell is eternal. But temporal is punishment for days or years or things like that. And it's fiery, fiery. If you think you can handle it, try putting your hand over a candle for two seconds and see if you can handle that, okay? So our work is not to see um, if we can, uh, how do I put this? If we can stay, we just get into purgatory because we know after purgatory is, is heaven. Our work is to try to make it to heaven straight. But it's difficult, right? And yeah, it's very difficult. But he says, let us help and commemorate them. If Job's sons were purified by their father's sacrifice, why would we doubt that our offerings for the dead bring them some consolation? Let us not hesitate to help those who have died and to offer our prayers for them. And this is St. John Chrysostom talking. Now, the church has three parts. We have the church triumphant, which is the, is the saints that have gone to heaven, and they have the full glory of everything that we hope for and we expect. And we have the church militant, which is we here on earth. Militant because we're still fighting. We're still fighting the forces of evil. We're still fighting... A, our own selfish, you know, our own desires, sinful desires, and we're still fighting the world, the false maxims of the world and the society and all the rubbish it brings, right? The, the church militant is also called the pilgrim church, and you hear this sometimes in the Eucharistic prayer, your pilgrim church on earth, right? So why are we call pilgrim church? Because as the Bible says, we are citizens of heaven. So we're just passing through earth right? And that's why we're also called Pilgrim Church. But there's another church which is called the Church Suffering. And these are the holy souls in purgatory. They're called holy souls. 
because they have no mortal sin and they're going to make it to heaven eventually. And just as we depend on the prayers, we hope for the prayers of the saints in heaven, the souls in purgatory also depend on our prayers as well. We need to pray for them as well. Okay? All right. So who goes to purgatory? Those with venial sins. Those with unexpiated mortal sins. So like I said, every sin has a consequence. Every single sin has a consequence. And let me give you an, a short example. If you kill someone and go and confess your sins, even though you're forgiven, the person stays dead. That's a consequence of sin, right? And it stays. Usually it stays and it, it has to be paid. And another example we have is David. When David sinned against God and he repented and we even got the book of Psalms, the, the chapter Psalms 51, which is all about his repentance and all of that, even though he did more penance after he repented and, and everything was forgiven, his son still died. That was a consequence of the sin, right? So sins have consequences. And if they're not expiated here, they have to be, you know, you have to be purified in purgatory. And that is why without self-mortifications like fasting and sacrifices and penance, we will not be able to pay off for the mortal sins. The consequences of the mortal sins we will not be, we will not fully expiate them, right? So, we need fasting, we need sacrifices, we need penance, we need to pray multiple times. We need all these things. We need almsgiving because all these things help us with, the, with purification, right? They purify us so that we can be free from all these, you know, both the venial sins and the unexpiated mortal sins. And then we can do confession to get rid of the guilt of the mortal sins themselves. Right? Those are what I call works of straw. If you look at 1 Corinthians 3, um, 12 to 15, it talks about you know works that are not like solid gold and they don't stand. And what example, let me, let me tell you how you can be doing these works. So for example, if you, do, um, if you do any good work and you grumble about it or you complain about it, or you're a complainer, or you, know, you do things but you want to gain attention, so you give... Um, arms to the poor, but you don't do it to help the poor out of love. You do it simply because you want your friend to see you as a good Catholic. Duh, duh, duh. Well, well, your friend should see you as a good Catholic because that is going to, you know, motivate them to be better Catholics themselves, and it's going to motivate them to also want to do good works. But if that is your only reason, right, just to get some kind of pride, then that is bad. You're supposed to have love. You're supposed to do it with love. Anything you do without love, no matter how awesome it is, right, it's it's useless. That is why if you read First Corinthians, um, I think it's chapter 13, uh, St. Paul says, even though you give up your body to be burnt, if you don't do it with love, it's nothing, right? Even though you give up, even though, like, you someone stabs you for Christ but you only you don't do that with love you only do it for vain glory or something like that it's meaningless right and so if you if you don't have mortal sin but you have all these meaningless works then purgatory right those who do not turn so what i mean by meaningless works i mean you only have meaningless works or what i call works of straw and you don't you know have good works the real good works so when i say good works is different from works of the law many people think about works of the law when they talk about good works works of the law don't save nobody things like you know killing a lamb now or spraying the blood or you know all those things they used to do in the old testament they don't work anymore right they don't work at all they can't forgive sins and things like that but good works work right that is why in, in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 24, it says that faith without works is dead. All right? Faith without works is dead. Okay? So if you read from verse 24, faith without works is absolutely dead. You need good works as well. And that is why St. Paul is going to tell us, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Okay? So lastly, those 
who do not turn to the divine mercy of Christ. Because eventually what you need is the mercy of God from the sacrament of confession, from prayer, all the graces that you can, God can give you, Jesus Christ can give you. You need all these things, right? And if you don't turn to God, you are not going to make it into heaven. Even though you don't commit any mortal sin, it's the mercy of God that will drag you into heaven. And without it, then best you can hope for is to land in purgatory and then be purified and go into heaven. And without the mercy of God, chances are you won't even make it into purgatory. You're going to hell. Even you know, so you need Jesus. That's basically what I'm trying to say. It's not just about doing good and don't doing bad. You need to pray to Jesus because there's so many things you don't even know are wrong or are sinful or so many associations that you may have that you don't know are bad. And then these things could actually have an impact on your spirituality, etc. Okay, so some of the saints say, the number of the elect is so small, so small, that were we to know how small it is, we would faint away with grief. One here and there scattered up and down the world. What is he saying is that many people miss heaven. Many people are condemned. Another saint says the greater number of Christians today are damned. The destiny of those dying on one day, so she uses one day as an example, is that very few not as many as 10. This is scary. Not as many as 10 went straight to heaven. Many remained in purgatory, and those cast into hell were as numerous as snowflakes in midwinter. And you see why. We looked at this in part one, where we talked about people that go to hell. Because many of the things that take people to hell are so common these days, even among Christians, even among Catholics. And that is why so many people go to hell. And then even those that that strive not to make, commit mortal sins and strive to um, abandon all these things, they don't even make it straight to heaven. They still have to be purified. And just a few, not as many as 10, make it straight to heaven. And we see all of these things. And when we look at scripture, we also see why. If you, O oh Lord, kept track of iniquities, then who, O oh Lord, could stand? And many people think that they can stand by themselves without turning to the mercy of God. And in Revelation, it says, Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. It tells us that only God is holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. And what is what is what are we learning from Revelation is that if we try to do this on our own, we immediately fail because only God is holy. And the only way we become holy, the only way we become perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, like Jesus Christ tells us to in Matthew 5.48, is by being with this God, basically attaching yourself to this holy God. That is the only way you can become holy. And how do you do that? By immersing yourself in all the ways that you can get graces from God and from Christ. The sacraments, the Eucharist, confession, prayer, 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 more prayer, fasting, sacrifices, almsgiving, all these things. You become more Christ-like and you stick with God and then you become holier. All right? And it's Isaiah that gives us a clue into this. He said, all of us have been sinful. Even our best actions are filthy through and through. Because of our sins, we are like leaves that wither and are blown away by the wind. No one turns to you in prayer. No one goes to you for help. You have hidden yourself from us and have abandoned us because of our sins. So you see, Isaiah figures it out. He says, the reason is because we are not turning to God for help. We think we can achieve holiness by ourselves. We think that if we just do a bunch of do's and don'ts, that we're going to get things all figured out. But Isaiah is telling us that we need to turn back to God in the sacrament of confession, in prayer, in almsgiving, in fasting. We need to be like Christ. All the things that Christ says we should do and the things he says he's going to judge. A lot of things he says he's going to judge in Matthew chapter 25. If you read from verse 35, he says, For I was hungry and you gave me to eat, thirsty and you gave me to drink, um, naked and you clothed me, in prison and you visited me, sick and you visited me. All these things, these are the things that God was going to judge, right? 
And all when we do these things, we become more like Christ. And we, with our prayers and with our constantly asking for God's mercy, we are purified and we become holier and holier and holier. All right? So, Divine Mercy Chaplet. You want to make it to heaven? I'll give you two means. Number one, Divine Mercy Chaplet. And there are 14 promises that Jesus himself gave. And I'm not going to put all 14 of them. You can just Google 14 you know, promises. If, you know what? I'm going to put a link in the description below so that you can go and see the promises that Jesus gave to those who will say this, this chaplet. And you can say it with your rosary, right? The souls that say this chaplet will be embraced by my mercy during their lifetime and especially at the hour of death. Tell me, if God gives you his mercy at the hour of death, what else do you need? You're going straight to heaven. Straight because his mercy just purifies you, right? That is actually what purifies you. So you need to say this prayer more often. When hardened sinners say, I fill their souls with peace, and the hour of their death will be a happy one. When they say this chaplet in the presence of the dying, I will stand between my father and the dying person, not as a just judge, but as a merciful savior, right? So this doesn't just work when you prayed for yourself, it only works when you prayed for other people. This is cool. This is what Jesus gives us as a means to save us. He continues, whoever will recite it will receive great mercy at the hour of death. Priests will recommend it to sinners as their last hope of salvation. Even though they were a sinner most hardened, if he were to recite this chaplet only once, he would receive grace from my infinite mercy. I desire to grant all unimaginable graces to those souls who trust in my mercy. But guess what? Like Isaiah says, we don't turn to God. And that is why so many people go to hell, even Christians, even Catholics. So many people go to hell because they believe that they can do it by themselves. They don't ask for God's mercy, right? And even those who miss hell, they thrown into purgatory because there's so much that needs to be purified. So much still needs to be cleansed. And they, many of them, they don't have all the mercy that they, they could have gotten from God. But Jesus is saying, even if this sin is most hardened, it's going to change him. So you're struggling with pornography for a billion years. And then you say this chapter, God throws his infinite mercy at you and engulfs you and purify. Oh my goodness, this is great. This is great news. And we are lucky to be in a generation that knows about the divine mercy, right? The prayer most pleasing to me is the prayer for the conversion of sinners. Know, my daughter, that this prayer is always heard and answered. What a guarantee. How many times do you see a prayer like this? Jesus said, it's always heard and answered. Guess what? It's always heard and answered. Right? Because when you pray to divine mercy, you're not just praying for yourself. You're praying for sinners all over the world as well. Because it says, for the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Right? I'm going to put a link in the description below where you can see a nice song version to pray the divine mercy chaplet. Okay? My mercy is greater than your sins and the sins of the entire world. Souls who spread the honor of my mercy at the hour of death, I will not be a judge for them, but a merciful Savior. What is Jesus Christ re-emphasizing here? He's saying he wants so many people to, you know, have this prayer and say this prayer that he's even given rewards. He's even blessing those who will promote this prayer. This is how much Jesus wants this prayer to be said. So not just by you, Diver, not just by you, but also your family, your friends, your, you know, it just teach everybody how to say this prayer and tell them the benefits of this prayer because it's so great. Jesus wants everybody to pray so that we can all go into heaven and skip hell and skip purgatory and make it straight into heaven. Anybody like fire? I don't like fire. You shouldn't like fire either. It's painful, right? And you hurt God. But with this, and this is one of the prayers you can actually feel having an effect on you. 
because while you're praying the divine mercy prayer you can actually you know feel it having an effect on you feel yourself changing it's almost as if you become a new person while you're praying this prayer you're going to feel it and you feel yourself becoming a new person while you're praying this prayer and many times the, the mistake people make is that after the prayer they're just like oh yeah i completed the prayer oh now let's just go have fun and then they don't even think about your spirituality anymore and that's so bad because this prayer actually refocuses you so that you can realize that God's mercy is right there for you. And then your next action should be to work on growing closer to God, going to confession, praying more, things like that. All right. What's the second prayer? The Holy Rosary. And this one we got very many promises. There are 15 promises. I'm also going to leave link in the description for you so that you can pray this you can um, look at the promises of the rosary, right? And you can also start praying the rosary. And interestingly, these two prayers can be done with the rosary. Like just one small rosary. And it's so powerful. But so many people do not even know how powerful it is. That's so sad, right? Okay, so Mary says, I promise my special protection and the greatest graces to all those who shall recite the rosary. Whoever shall have a true devotion for the rosary shall not die without the sacraments of the church. What an assurance. So you know that you're going to get what? You're going to get confession. You're going to get the Eucharist. You're going to get... You, if you are a soul that is devoted to the rosary, you're not going to be left hanging at the moment of your death. Imagine getting... The Eucharist and confession at the moment of your death. Slate wiped clean. Newborn baby boy going straight to heaven. That's an awesome grace to receive. I shall deliver from purgatory those who have been devoted to the rosary. So it's not just dragging you out of hell. It's also dragging you out of purgatory. All those who propagate the rosary shall be aided by me in their necessities. So again, this prayer is not just for you. You're supposed to spread it. You're supposed to spread it with your family members, with your friends, with all those you teach. If you're a catechism teacher, if you're a priest, I don't know. Whatever you are, diver, you are supposed to spread this. Okay? What else? The faithful children of the rosary shall have, shall merit a high degree of glory in heaven. So not just, so you skip hell, you skip purgatory. You make it into heaven. And now you have a high degree of glory in heaven. Did you know that there is hierarchy in heaven? Of course there is. Jesus talks about this as well. When he was talking about John the Baptist, he said that John the Baptist was the greatest on earth. But he said even the least person in heaven is greater than John the Baptist. Why? Because that time John the Baptist was still on earth. And anybody who is in heaven is greater than everybody on earth. Why? Because they are doing the perfect will of God and they have no temptations to sin and they're purified and they're sinless and all of that. But if Jesus used the words least in heaven, it means there is hierarchy in heaven. Right? Everybody in heaven is not on the same degree. And you see that with the orders of the angels, even their archangels, their seraphim, their cherubim, their guardian angels and all of that. They have different orders and different ranks. And same thing with the saints when they go to heaven. They have different ranks and different orders and things like that. And guess what? Jesus Christ is saying, um, the, one of the promises of the rosary is that you're going to have a high degree of glory in heaven. That's so cool. And you shall obtain all you ask of me by the recitation of the um, rosary. I have obtained from my divine son, this is Mary talking, that all the advocates of the rosary shall have for intercessors the entire celestial court during their life and at the hour of death. Everyone in heaven is praying for you. How cool is that? If you had just one priest on earth praying for you every single day of your life, that would be awesome. That would be legendary. That would be so super cool. Now imagine having everybody in heaven praying for you every single time, including just before you're dying. That's so cool. All who recite the rosary are my sons and daughters and brothers and sisters of my only son, Jesus Christ. Family, bo. You're part of the family. Cool. Whoever shall recite the rosary devoutly, applying himself to the consecration of the sacred mysteries, which means you're meditating on it, shall never be conquered by misfortune. God will not chastise him in his justice. 
he shall not perish by an unprovided debt, if he be just and shall remain in the grace of God and become worthy of eternal life. Oh, and there are more promises of both the divine mercy and the rosary. Look at this. You have an opportunity to pray the rosary and the divine mercy. And, and interestingly, you can pray two of them together. And it'll just be 25 minutes max, right? For the rosary and the divine mercy. You can Once you finish the Hail Holy Queen and you finish all the prayers of the rosary, you just go into the divine mercy for the sake of the sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. And you just keep going and you finish the divine mercy. And all of that is just going to take you about 25 minutes. Are you telling me that in 24 hours of a day, you can't bring out 25 minutes? You stay on Instagram longer than that. You stay on YouTube longer than that. You stay on you stay on Facebook longer than that. You watch movies longer than that. You probably even shower longer than that and cook longer than that. You go to the market and you shop longer than that. You do so many things longer than that. 25 minutes. That's all. A movie. Hey, a single episode of a cartoon is, is probably that length. And you can watch three episodes back to back. If, if it's a movie episode, it's about 40 minutes. And you can watch back to back and you can, come on, you have 25 minutes in a day. And you can do that very early in the morning or just before you go to bed. Or you can do it throughout the day and you can do so many things. Just, and, and look at all the things you stand to gain. It's amazing. And you can just, all you need is just one tiny rosary in your hand. It, they're so small. And what they're capable of doing, you would think that they would be the size of a gun or something like that. But they're so small and they're so powerful. And these, these are the things that God has given us, ways to enter into heaven, to go for confession and to recite the rosary and to do the divine mercy. And we know that we are going into heaven and we receive the Eucharist, which is the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And he transforms us. And he has given us all these things available for us to use. But guess what? Guess what? People don't go for confession. People don't receive the Eucharist. People receive the Eucharist in mortal sin. They don't go for confession and then they receive the Eucharist, damning themselves, condemning themselves even more. That is horrible because scripture says in 1 Corinthians 11 that he who eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks condemnation to himself. And this is similar to what happened to Judas. You see, Judas came to the first mass and Jesus changed the bread and wine to his body and blood. And Judas ate and scripture says, and at once Satan entered him. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? Right? So we damn ourselves. We condemn ourselves and we go for Eucharist without confession. We need to go for confession, right? When we have mortal sin, we must go for confession before Eucharist. And we, we don't do simple things. And here's rosary. Here's divine mercy. Simple things with great, powerful, enormous promises. But we don't do that. And then we struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle and boom, still make it to hell. All because we didn't do simple daily things that we could have done to avoid such devastating fate. Right? So, you know what to do. Go for confession. Receive the Eucharist more often. Go for confession at least once a week. If you're a crazy person, once every two weeks. Don't be a crazy person. Go once a week. Right? Right? Good. And then pray the rosary and the divine mercy. I like to pray it back to back. Do back to back. That way you do both of them instantly. And you're cool. And it, it gives you graces every single day. Right? And if you want to learn more about stuff like this, Catholic teachings or ways that you can use Catholic teachings to change your life ever so subtly, all aspects of your life, spiritual, psychological, emotional, social, you know, physical, financial, all of those things. This is what we're going to be talking about on this channel, Youth Dive, and you're going to learn how to do all of these things. If this is what you're looking for, a place where you diver can come here and enjoy all the teachings, we'll hit the subscribe button. I want you to share this and 
yeah share the part one too so that people don't get confused and wonder where we all started from and share the part one and everybody's going to be happy because they're going to learn this stuff all right so i want to thank you very much in conclusion we have know your catholic faith and learn more about it daily because um so that you don't have that culpable ignorance that we spoke about in past one. Go for Mass more frequently than just once a week because every Mass you attend is equal in essence and merit to the death of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary because it's the same Jesus Christ whose body and blood is there for the forgiveness of sins and we are doing that in memory of him. Same way he was on the cross of Calvary for the forgiveness of sins. And resist mortal sin with all your strength, no matter what. Don't give in to the temptation of the devil that says, Oh, just do this and go confess it later. Don't do that, right? Mortal sin kills you. And you don't know where you're going to die physically. If your soul is dead and then your body dies, you're lost forever. For all eternity. Hell never stops. All right? And frequent confession. If you've fallen into mortal sin, for whatever reason, you've fallen into mortal sin, pick up yourself and run back to confession. The longer you stay in mortal sin, the harder it is to get back to confession. And that is why you see... When you stay for one day, now you stay for a few days, then you stay for a week, and then you stay for two weeks, and then it's a month, and then I've heard someone who hasn't gone for confession for years, and you have two years, five years, ten years, fifteen years, and things like that. And that's so bad. That's very, very bad. Why? Because you didn't go quickly. And think of it like a wound. If you have a wound, right, on your body, and... You don't treat it immediately. What's going to happen? It's going to get infected. And then it's going to cause more problems. Now you need more um, strength to get back to... You need more treatment to get back to the way you were before. So in the same way, if you sit in mortal sin now, mortal sin gets quote-unquote infected. And then you need more strength and more you know, struggle to get back to confession. And that's hard. Right, And it's not just for when you commit mortal sin, it's also for your future fight. So go every single week. Pray the Rosary and Divine Mercy daily. Right, And I want to thank you so very much for listening to this. Please subscribe again. Have I said that a million times already? Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. subscribe.